Transport and the environment is the theme tonight. I was thinking of starting with that iconic picture of the polar bear floating on the iceberg out in the middle of the sea. Um, but instead, I went with an image of the stock exchange. It's not that I'm not worried about the polar bear. I'm quite a nice guy, really. Um, <laughs> I'm also significantly worried about the prospects of climate change. But I've been doing three years of research on how we can actually tackle carbon management, carbon reduction in the transport sector. And in the current environment, you can't help but come to the overwhelming conclusion that we've forgotten what we're trying to do. So we have started to go back to infrastructure investment to stimulate jobs in the economy. So some of this might work. Some of it might work in a green context. But some of it's working the other way. Do we need to add extra lanes on our motorways? Do we need some of these additional bypasses? Aren't we going to be struggling with the same things that we've been struggling with for the last 30 years? Extra traffic growth that all this will generate. How's that come about? Well, I think what it does is it actually reminds us that transport never has been and never will be a one-issue um, topic area. So we have to think about the relationship between transport and the environment in the future. But we also have to think about the relationship between transport and the economy, jobs and growth. And beyond that, we can think about transport and public health and the obesity crisis that we might face. And we can think about social exclusion and the access that people need to key services and jobs uh, and healthcare and so on. So it's actually an integrated agenda that we need to think about. And if we're going to make progress on transport and the environment, we need to do so in a kind of bundle that actually makes sense. If we don't, we're going to end up having some kind of policy flip-flop. Every time a new agenda starts to become more pressing than something else, we suddenly forget where it was that we were going and start doing some of the things that we shouldn't do. So I'm going to try and encourage us tonight to think about the journey that we should go on um, to deliver this vision for the future, which is more integrated. And I think the way we do that is we need to think about the city of tomorrow. And we started some of that thinking in Michelle's presentation there. What sort of city? Do we want to live in, in the future? And how can we make it work? So I'd ask you all to think about cities that you've been to that have got a buzz, a vibe, somewhere that you think, wow, that's an economically uh, busy place. It's a nice place to get around. It's a nice place to be. Um, everyone think of your own particular places that you like. I mean, when I think of, of, of cities like that, I think of places like uh, Vancouver, maybe, or Copenhagen, or Stockholm, or Bremen. You, the list can go on. What is it that these cities already do that we should be doing more of? Um, I've got some images here from Copenhagen. Now, Copenhagen is one of the cycling capitals of the world. Not everywhere can be a Copenhagen. How did they stumble across this magic formula? Well, maybe some of it was luck. But actually, I think most of it is actually a very long, consistent set of policies which have been trying to deliver the same thing year after year. And they're self-reinforcing. So their public squares have large parts taken up by cycle parking. That's a big statement. On the trains, they have an image of the cycle saying, bring your bike on here. These are commuter trains. In the UK, you have to ask which train it is that you might be able to take your bike on during the peak. So quite a different mindset. The bike's really important. And even though they have thousands and thousands of people cycling around the city, they still bother to put up cycle counters telling you how many thousands of people are there. It's a really visible statement about what's important in the city. So there are some things there which work. And I think what we need to do is think about what works in the cities of today, and then think about what context is changing, and how can we bring the context of change together with some of the things that we know that work to generate the cities that we want to see tomorrow. So um, let's think about what some of these things are that really work. Well, I think one of the things that makes cities great is that people come there to interact. That's why you're in cities. That's why you're all in the TED audience tonight. You came because you wanted the buzz of an event where you could interact with other people. So face-to-face -face time uh, and, and interaction is really what is at the heart of the knowledge economy of the future. We want fluid labor markets. We want people to be able to exchange high-quality ideas with each other. I would warrant that something else which we're going to want in the future is an improved quality of life. Is anyone here in the audience sat there, you know, would you think that it's acceptable for the quality of life for you in the future, for your children or grandchildren, to be lower than the quality of life today? No, we all aspire to an improved quality of life. 
So can we create cities which facilitate all this interaction and increase our quality of life? Now, what else is it about the cities of today or the lifestyles of today that we might have to carry with us into this future vision? I think there are some uh, important structural factors. I mean, let's start with bricks and mortar. Most of the bricks and mortar that we have today are going to be with us in 30, 40, 50 years' time. This fantastic building that we're in tonight is older than all of us in this room. And so we're going to have to adapt the cities that we've got. We can't rip everything up and start again. It's about intelligent adaptation of the resources that we have in front of us. Then there are some important, uh, I guess, societal structural uh, factors which aren't going to change drastically over that kind of time period, such as the relationship between education and work, the school day and the working day. That limits the degree of flexibility that we have to move our activities around, for example our natural biorhythms. We don't have a 24-hour society because actually we work better during daylight hours and that's just something we're going to have to uh, learn to work with. Okay? So there are some things which we can, we can take with us into this vision uh, of the future which we probably understand reasonably well today. But then there's some big changes that are coming. That's an image of my car. That's not one of the big societal changes that's coming, although I may change it in the next couple of years. But it's actually quite typical of the car fleet of the UK. It's eight years old. And the average age of a vehicle in the UK is eight years. The average age of a bus is eight years. Uh, we change our trains every 20 or 30 years. Sometimes in transport, we think too much just about the system of transportation. Right, how many people in the audience, if you can just raise your hands, uh, are still using the same mobile handset that you were eight years ago? OK, I've got, I got one at the back there, so I'll have a look at that later. That's a piece of history, right? Um, we're on mobile phone contracts of 12 months or um, you know, 24 months. The turnover in our mobile technology and the turnover in the capabilities which mobile technology uh, uh, and the digital economy are providing is actually uh, you know, far faster than what we're seeing in terms of, of the vehicle fleet. And, and the opportunities that this new technology is providing now, where we can see uh, where other people are in the city, we can see where some of the smart cars that Michelle were talking about, whether they're around the corner, whether they're available, it opens up all this flexibility for new thinking about new forms of transportation systems. But it actually does a whole lot more than that for me. There's some really interesting trends going on at the moment. The average age with which people are taking up a driving license is increasing. So it's now moving up in, uh, into the 20, 25-year-old uh, bracket. The average age which people are get, kids are getting mobile phones is as low as eight in some parts uh, of the country. So um, we're seeing these trends going in opposite directions. But what it means is that for 14, 15 years, maybe longer, children are going to have access, or young adults are going to have access to mobile uh, technology which allows them to live this more flexible lifestyle and I think it's going to become embedded in the way that we actually go about doing things and that provides a real shift so for people like me who've maybe been brought up on the traditional car based model you know we think about journey time that's wasted we think about travel time and then we think about maybe some of the opportunities that mobile technology gives us to do while we're, while we're making these journeys I think um, you know people of tomorrow are going to be thinking about connected time they're going to be thinking about what they can do when they're connected. And some of that time might also be time that they're, they're traveling. But they, want, they will want opportunities to, where they can travel, where they've got the possibility of staying connected and making use of all these different facilities. So that turns things on its head. We don't need to be designing transport systems that are ever faster. We need to be designing transport systems that allow people to get around and make the most of these interaction opportunities. So we don't have to be faster. We don't have to be using more and more resources for these sorts of things. Now, there are also some other big changes uh, which are afoot in terms of vehicle technology. Uh, and this is coming as a result of the big push um, fr resulting from the climate change agenda. If we're really going to tackle our climate change emissions and cut them by 80% by 2050, then we're going to have to decarbonize the whole energy sector. And we can move to uh, a wholly electric fleet, for example. But for the last 80, 100 years, we've been filling our cars up at the pump. And we've been paying tax at a quite different rate to the rate that we pay tax on domestic energy. So we're taxed very highly, certainly in Europe, on, on petrol and diesel fuel. 
If we go to domestic energy and we're paying domestic VAT rates as our tax rate, then the per mile cost of driving is going to fall through the floor. Now, we shouldn't be surprised if we just leave things as they are in that kind of scenario if people start using their cars more and more because it's cheaper. We know that relationship exists today. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think it provides a big opportunity for us to change the way we pay for travel. I mean, at the moment, we already pay for peak hour travel on public transport. There are plenty of examples of smart pricing. We all quite accept the Ryanair model uh, of paying particular amounts for, for travel at busier times or to busier places. Um, this is an opportunity for us to renegotiate how we pay for transport. And I think, again, this will encourage us to move towards more shared solutions because we'll actually have a more rational uh, way of using our road space. It's not that we don't have enough infrastructure. It's just that we don't use it in a very intelligent way. So this is an opportunity, I see, that we could grasp or we could miss to bring uh, these agendas together and turn it into a pro-environmental uh, agenda, but one which also makes sound economic sense. So I've probably filled you with a load of ideas that that potentially scare you, because it scares me when I think about the complexity of all the different things that I have to try and knit together when I'm thinking about what the transport policy of the future might be. But it's what's exciting about being a transport planner. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning, and it's what sometimes gets my students out of bed in the morning as well. What we need to do, though, if we're going to avoid some of these terrible sort of policy flip-flops that I've observed over the last few years, this lack of progress, this real um, slowness to, to, to make change, is to develop a compelling vision for the future. Because I think at the moment we struggle to bring together these complex narratives about the economy, about healthy lifestyles, um, and about the environment. And I think the way to do this is to imagine the, the livable cities of the future. So what I would encourage us to do is not to bury our heads in the sand and say this is all too difficult, but actually what we need to do is set out a vision. We need to keep our eyes on the horizon and we need to try and bring these agendas together because otherwise we'll miss some of these opportunities. And they are only just opportunities. If we don't seize them, then we may end up generating the wrong sorts of outcomes. Thank you very much.